I love Passover time. And you know, it's funny because a number of people make jokes about having to eat matzah all the time. If that was the worst we would have to sacrifice, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> and of course, now that there's egg matzah, whatever happened to the Manischewitz grape matzah? Did anybody remember eating that? No? Pat and I must be the only ones. That was the best matzah ever. And I don't know what happened to it. It was, it was super. But I haven't seen it in years. But you know, uh, well, we'll talk about that, that sacrifice of eating matzah in a couple moments. But just to go over some, some, uh, some things about Passover, then we're going to go into Yom Habikurim, uh, first fruits. But you know, s Passover is part of these seven feasts, uh, four in the spring and three in the fall. And we are to celebrate these feasts from generation to generation. This is really one of the things that, that makes Messianic Judaism, Messianic Judaism is the celebration of God's appointed times. Not that other people don't do it too, but it's certainly something that is high on our priority list as celebrating the Lord through these holy days. And I'm so glad that Eric mentioned what he did about Jew and Gentile coming together because really this is, if, if your heart is for the Lord, you are invited to participate in all of God's appointed times. And uh, whether you're Jewish or whether you're not Jewish, uh, it's both are okay. And these, these appointed times really give us a sense of God's redemptive program from the death of Yeshua all the way through to the Messianic kingdom. And we see that uh, God's word is, is progressive in the sense that the disciples began to understand. You know, they, they were with Yeshua and they didn't really understand until Yeshua died and then he was buried and then he rose again. And these things all became more clear as time went on. Even though they had the scriptures, they didn't totally understand all that was for them. And that's true for us as well. We don't understand everything. We just don't. Um, so we're going to, looking at Passover, it's interesting. I, I think Passover is the appointed time that is most important in God's word, if for no, no other reason that it's mentioned over 70 times in Scripture, both Hebrew Scriptures and the Buri Chadasha, the New Covenant. And uh, there's no other appointed time mentioned more than 10 times. So just because of that, we see that it's important. And it certainly begins God's redemptive plan. But I'd like to mention 10 things that I see in Passover, uh, just things that I think are really important to think about. I'm not going to explain them. We've talked about Passover. If you haven't had a Seder, you'll be having a Seder. Uh, if you, you know, so I, I'm sure that everybody's up on this. But here are 10 thoughts. The Lamb of God that takes away sin. Critical, key principle. Yeshua is the only way, just like there was only one way for the firstborn to be saved with the blood over the doorpost. Number three, God wants us to be free, free of sin, free of anything that holds us back from having a relationship with him. Four, matzah reminds us that God desires us to be holy without sin as Yeshua is holy. Number five, we are to be humble and care for the needs of others first as we see Yeshua uh, cleaning even the disciples' feet. Number six, we remember who God is and what he's done. You know, there's only one Passover, really. Everything else, and that was done 
as we see in Exodus 12. But all the other Passovers that we celebrate are just a remembrance, a memorial of what happened then. And, um, and also, the future Passovers will be uh, um, amazing in terms of what will happen in, in, the, in the future. But number seven, we have the Lord's Supper, which is also a remembrance. It says in Luke twenty two nineteen, when uh, he had taken matzah and offered the bracha, the blessing, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. So every time we do the Lord's Supper, it's in memory. It, it brings a special understanding of who God is. Um, by the way, I just have, I think one of the best discussions or teachings I've ever heard on Passover was two nights ago. Uh, my wife taped uh, Jesus in the Passover on CBN. Anybody else see it with Jason Sobel? Jason Sobel's always amazing, but he really did a beautiful job. For those of you who would like to check, you know, oftentimes you can go back and get a, an, a, a program. This is a program worth listening to. Jason has tremendous insights. Uh, yeah, so it's Jesus in the Passover on CBN, and uh, I don't know when it originated, when it was, but it was great. Number eight, uh, remember God is faithful. It, this is a crucial part of Passover, that God is faithful so we can believe for ourselves today, because he was faithful yesterday. He'll be faith he was faithful today. He'll be faithful tomorrow. Number nine, that we are to trust God. <laughs> Probably the hardest thing we're asked to do is to trust God, because we feel all these things coming against us, and we sense the turning in our stomach and the stuff that gets us irritated with people, with circumstances, with everything. And if we trust God, none of it means anything, you know, because we're focused on him. It's just when we take our eyes off of him and we look at the situations, we can really feel like we're sinking in the water. But there's Yeshua always ready if we trust him to take his hand. And uh, number 10, intimacy with God is, is so clear, uh, the, the, la uh, the Lord's Supper is such a, a beautiful time of intimacy with the Lord. And, and so those are some of my takeaways with Passover. I'm sure there are more. But I, I really like to focus on Yom HaBikurim, the Feast of the First Fruits. Uh, it, it, it tells of the earliest harvest that took place in Israel during the time of Yeshua, Yom HaBikurim. The barley harvest was the first harvest of the spring, and it was a time to thank God for all he gave us. And the thought was that if God blessed us with early harvest, he would also bless us with great harvest in the later summer months. And, you know, when you read Leviticus 23, as we will in a minute, really you don't get a sense of this is like this amazing time or amazing appointed time that we have with God. It's not until we really see what the new covenant says about first fruits that we really understand the importance of this, and certainly when we recognize Yeshua's, uh, Yeshua being raised. So Leviticus 23, verse 10, speak to B'nai Yisrael and tell them, when you have come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you are to bring the Omer of uh, you know, I can't read the word harvest. I can't think of the word harvest without thinking of people coming to know the Lord. And I, I really pray that you are uh, sensitive to this time of year, especially for Jewish people, that this should be a time where they are challenged to come to know the Lord. Um, so 
just and and look if you get a little harvest now maybe uh, god will give us an even greater one in the fall with Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I continue to pray that that uh, prayer of acceleration that's in the front of the Counting the Omer book. Oh, we didn't count the Omer today. That's right, I forgot to do it. I was going to do it after William. You know what? Um, hmm. Never too late. Come on, let's count the Omer. So, today is day two. Can you back up? Or you've already done it. Oh, you're so good, Nance. So, Saturday, April the 8th, the second day. Uh, join me in the Hebrew. And one of the beautiful things about doing this for 50 days, if you do this every day for 50 days, you will be an expert on this prayer in Hebrew. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu Mitzvatov Vitzivanu Al Sifarat HaOmer. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has set us apart by your commandments and has commanded us to count the Omer. Today is the second day of the first week, and day two I have counted the Omer. So the theme of this counting the Omer in the devotional, which hopefully all of you have, and if you don't, it's available in the foyer, to give out to others or to have for yourself, is the Holy Spirit and revival. And so in Acts 1.8 it says, but you will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh has come upon you. Feel free to read with me. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. After you heard the message of truth, the good news of your salvation, and when you put your trust in him, you were sealed with the promised Ruach HaKodesh. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of his possession in his, his prey. Okay. And the thought from Leonard Ravenhill said, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. Yeah, you know, it's so simple, but it's so strong. Consider that. Consider that. Secondly, uh, the Ruach seals our guarantee of who we are in the Lord. We receive power from the Ruach. This should provide the prompting we need to cry out for revival. We also receive the power to pursue our goal, a continued reawakening of the reality of God continuously in our life. So our challenge for today was your, is to cry out for revival each morning. Ask God and I to pour out his ruach upon you. Open your heart to truly desire God taking over your life. And the prayer today, Adonai, let me be confident in all your promises, especially that I am sealed by the Ruach HaKodesh. My redemption is guaranteed. I pray for your power to come upon me and revive me so that I may bask in your presence and be effective in the presence that you have called me, minister, I'm sorry, ministry that you have called me to, leading others to your presence and to your revival spirit. Amen. So I pray not only will you do this and the prayers in the beginning, those first pages two through five each day, but also that you will allow this devotion to uh, direct you into other areas. And so feel free just to expand on what is written there and allow God to work. So um, if I don't know if you can remember where we were, but we were in Leviticus 23, 10 through 15. 
And uh, actually, I'm not going to read all of it, but I would like to pick it up uh, in verse 12, which starts, On the day, on the day when you wave the Omer, you are to offer a male lamb without blemish. So the first thing in this offering here, the sacrifice, is to offer a male lamb without blemish. Blem yes, without blemish. But secondly, in verse 13, it says, uh, the grain offering should be mixed with flour and oil, and, and so that's talking about bread. And then finally it says, and there will be a drink offering, which will be wine. So here we have the lamb, the unblemished lamb. We have the wine and the bread. And... Um, you know, one would think, oh, my, is this once again a celebration of the Lord's Supper? So it's just an interesting thing. Now, Paul connects this holy day to the resurrection of Yeshua. And we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15 for quite a while. I really believe that uh, the best way to realize what God wants is to allow Scripture to comment on Scripture. And so we're going to read a lot and maybe just think about it and see what God would have us know. So we start, we're going to start... Um, well, before we do that, before we read um, 1 Corinthians 15, let me just mention two things about Yom Habikurim, which I find pretty amazing. The first is that when you put your trust in Yeshua, you know that you will be raised from the dead to eternal life. And that, that in itself is incredible. Um, you know, Yeshua's resurrection was the beginning, the first fruit, and we... All who belong to Mashiach, to Messiah, they will be the fruit remaining, the first fruit, and will be re resurrected. Secondly, the resurrection exhibits God's power. And I love the scripture in Philippians 3, 10, and 11. So I let's talk about this a little. My aim is to know him and the power of his resurrection. So think of this, that we are to know him, the Lord, and the power of his resurrection. Then it says, and the sharing of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, if somehow I might arrive at the resurrection from among the dead. So here's my thought on this, because why are we to desire power, and suffering together. I really believe that if we had power alone, there are very few of us who would not be puffed up. We would be prideful. We would think that we're, we're everything and everybody should listen to us and, and we're it. Suffering brings us humility. You know how believers don't like to admit to suffering because they want to appear to always be powerful and in, you know, having everything together. But in this verse, God is saying you need the power and the suffering because in a sense what it's going to do is it's going to keep you in, in the center of where God wants us to be. He wants us to walk in power, but he also wants us to walk in humility and be able to handle the sufferings of this world. I can't imagine anybody in the sanctuary here who isn't going through something, some difficulty, some problem, some issue. And God is saying that the suffering is, is what not only we have to go through, but he had to go through. But notice how he went through it. 
And he, we can recognize his power while he went through it. And people should be able to recognize our power of joy and peace and strength while we go through sufferings. So that's an aside, uh, but one that I think is very important. So now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll start with verse 3. For I also passed on to you, first of all, what I also received, that Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kepha, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive. Let's stop here for a second. So 500 people saw Yeshua after he died. Over 500 people. Now, this is important because when people are challenging your faith and they don't believe certain things, if 500 separate people said that they had a personal encounter with Yeshua, that is strong in terms of saying that this was real. Uh, I, I think that if there were people at that time that would have challenged that, we would know it somehow. But it wasn't challenged, even when it was written. And uh, the fact that most of them, when this was written, was still alive, so it could have been challenged, but it wasn't. Then he appeared to Jacob, then to all the emissaries, and last of all, to as one untimely born, he also appeared to me. I can't figure out if uh, Paul is, has a great sense of humor or if he's truly humble. Uh, I, I can't figure that out. Uh, I mean, just the verbiage, and, and last of all, as one untimely born, I mean, that to me almost sounds humorous because of all people, he was not untimely born. He was born for a very great purpose and a great calling and a, such an amazing example of God's grace to a human being who didn't deserve it. And so, um, but I, I don't know. It, it's, uh, yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 14. Now, if Messiah is proclaimed that he has been raised from the dead, how can some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? See, it it was then, it was now, it's all the time, right? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Messiah has been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, then our proclaiming is meaningless and your faith also is meaningless, So the importance of resurrection is critical. It's not just in Romans 10, 9, and 10, you know, if you uh, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But this is taking the, in a sense, the opposite. You know, if this isn't true, everything we're talking about, everything we're, it's all meaningless. It's all meaningless. 1 Corinthians 15, through 19, 15, 15 through 19. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified about God that he raised up Messiah, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Messiah has been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Messiah have perished. If we have hoped in Messiah in this life alone, we are to be pitied more than all people. Now, I know that some of you who share your faith try and explain all of this to somebody who does not believe. 
But I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, that it would be more powerful to have somebody read that paragraph and figure it out on their own. Because at the end of it, it says, if this isn't true, then we all should be pitied. And the fact that that's written in scripture is a really important thing to say that this is not just something we're telling you because uh, we believe a certain way. This is something that is life-changing. And you have to either get on board or not. So you read what God has had Paul say about this and judge for yourself what side you want to be on. Oftentimes, it's better to use a third-party influence than to explain things yourself because people know you and they just think, oh, here we go again. <laughs> and so if you get out certain scriptures and you have them ready and say, hey, you read this and you tell me what you think, it becomes powerful. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also come through a man, has come through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah will all be made alive. And now you say, well, what questions do you have? Does that, is that clear to you? 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But each in its own order, Messiah the firstfruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Messiah. So you say to them, well, you, you know how to belong to Messiah, right? Okay. Then you pull out Romans 10, 9, and 10. Uh, then the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's a really powerful statement. The last enemy of God to be destroyed is death. Do you realize how strong that overcomes all the questions? Think about it. For God has put all things in subjection underneath his feet. So as people read this, even who don't know what's going on, they're beginning to understand that God is going to be victorious. And those who belong to God are going to be victorious. And a lot of it has to do with the power of God's resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. But when the psalmists say that all has been put in subjection, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put all things under Messiah. Now, when all things become subject to him, then the Son himself will also become subject to the one who put all things under him, so that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 32 to 34 if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. 1 Corinthians 15 is a pretty wild chapter. I'm not sure we spend enough time in it. Jumping to verses 42 to 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. 
sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15.50 Now I say this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And what decays cannot inherit what does not decay. This again, another important concept because people don't understand about the spiritual nature of God, but this puts it very clear that our bodies don't inherit the kingdom of God because they decay. But what decays cannot inherit what does not decay. What does not decay? The kingdom of God. It's eternal. And that's why our spirit is living with God forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last shofar, for the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. Believe that this is talking about Rosh Hashanah. But that we'll talk about in the fall. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this corruptible must, be on, must put on incorruptibility, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this incorruptible will have put on incorruptibility, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. And this is, again, so powerful. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the Torah. But thanks be to God who keeps giving us the victory through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Therefore, my dearly loved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Spend some time in the next few days reading 1 Corinthians 15. I would venture to say that many of you have not been there for a while, and it is worth digging in and letting God's Spirit work what he wants to do in us as the reality of God and his power and what he wants for us in terms of thinking and believing, this is a key chapter, I believe. One of the things that's interesting is that the Jews of that time understood about resurrection. As we read in John eleven twenty four to 26, Martha said to Yeshua, I know he will rise again, speaking of Lazarus, in the resurrection on the last day. Yeshua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. So interesting sentence there, that not only am I be going to be raised from the dead, but I am coming to bring you life. I am the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So, the strength of what God wants to do in our hearts and in our minds concerning resurrection and 
you know, oftentimes people wonder about, you know, there's, there are these debates, is, is, is Yeshua divine? Is, is he really God in the flesh? And we see here that in, in this scripture that he is saying that he is life. So there is no man who can say that they are life. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. In his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of of Messiah Yeshua from the dead. So again, the power that is shown and believing in Yeshua and believing in his resurrection allows us to understand the power of God to some extent. Obviously, we'll never really understand it because we don't have any frame of reference to understand the enormity of God. So the resurrection brings power into our life, it brings hope, it brings eternal life, and it brings the conviction that Yeshua is not only Messiah, but he's also Lord. And I would welcome anybody who has never accepted Yeshua as Messiah and Lord into their life to do that now and and certainly, you couldn't find a better time uh, during Pesach and Yom HaBikurim. So become a first fruit after Messiah, meaning that when we die, since Messiah has already died and resurrected, we are a first fruit after him. So receive Yeshua into your heart by repenting of your sins, by believing that Yeshua was raised from the dead, and Yeshua, you're asking him to come into your heart, into your life, into your mind, into your spirit, and your resolve is that you're going to dedicate your life forever to the Lord. Hallelujah. Those of you who have said that, feel free to let us know whether it's on Facebook or here in the sanctuary. I'd like to give you a free Bible for your wonderful journey with the Lord. So if it's from Facebook, please call us. Normally I would pray here, but I really find this scripture a good scripture to close with. It's Ephesians 1 starting with verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches, richness of his glorious inheritance in the saints, in the Kiddushim, in the, in the believers, and what is his exceedingly great power toward us who keep trusting him in keeping with the work of his mighty strength. This power he exercised in Messiah when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heaven. He is far above any ruler, authority, power, leader, and every name that is named, not only in the Olam Hazeh, which is this present age, but also in the Olam Haba, which is the age to come. Father, we dedicate our reading of Scripture to you. We dedicate our actions to you. We dedicate our love to you. We dedicate our praise and worship to you. So, Father, as we finalize this time together as a mishpocha, as, as a family, as, as, as just uh, 
people who come together to give you praise and worship, Lord, receive our sacrifice, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as we close with worship.